our mobility, our access to education, employment, health care, even our very speech. While the country waits to see if Congress will fix the broken immigration system, more than 11 million undocumented people are left in limbo. Over the past few years, those living in the shadows have begun to organize, but some have an even tougher hurdle to climb. And we have to get better at fighting for the people that don't look like us, but are still vulnerable in some of the ways we are. On this edition, we hear from queer immigrants in the U.S., having to hide not only their legal identity, but often their sexuality, too. I'm Andrew Stelzer, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. On the campaign trail, Barack Obama spoke often about working for the rights of gays and lesbians and for immigration reform. But both took a back seat to health care. Now, with the November 2010 elections looming, it's unclear whether Congress will take up the issue of immigration at all. Meanwhile, millions of people in the U.S. are still working without papers, driving without a license, and going to school without citizenship in a country they call home. And the overall number of immigrants who've been deported hasn't changed much under President Obama. By some estimates, it's even gone up. One group of immigrants has it particularly bad. Lesbian, gay, bi, trans, and queer people of color. Already marginalized because of their race, discriminated against because of their sexuality, and often facing danger if they're deported. Today, we hear the stories of four queer immigrants living in the U.S., the reasons they want to stay, and the obstacles they've faced along the way. Two are speaking for themselves, and two more are reading the accounts of their friends, who wish to remain anonymous. They spoke at the Asian American Writers Workshop in New York City in March 2010. My name is Anja and I am in a binational relationship. I am a U.S. citizen. I've been a U.S. citizen since uh, January 2009. Woohoo, Obama! <laughs> <laughs> My partner is, uh, has a citizenship in India. We have been apart for 155 days. It is hard. Uh, it has been five months. We attempted to move to Canada after 18 years of my partner, uh, Piali, uh, she had been in this country for 18 years, living, working, being a student here. Work permit after work permit, it finally ran out. And in September, uh, in our attempts to move to Toronto, oh, Canada, we were denied. Uh, she was denied a, a visitor's <coughs> visa and was told to go back to her country to spend some time there. So we've been apart since September of 2009. The holidays that we would have spent together, Halloween, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Boxing Day, shopping, uh, New Year's Eve, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Junior New Year, President's Day, Valentine's Day. Her birthday. And in four days, our two year anniversary. It's unfortunate because of the fact that even though Piali has been here for 18 years, uh, she did not have the ability to change her immigration status from just a worker to resident to permanent resident to citizen. The other thing is, is that if we were a straight couple, I'm sure she'd ask me to marry her. <laughs> Oh wait, is it the other way around? <laughs> so, pretty much my story is that uh, we've been separated for five months now, 155 days, and we hope to be reunited soon, but we don't know when that's going to be, and uh, if this does go back to her, to say that I love you. Hi, 
Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Ari Slau. And I'm, uh, um, I'm here to tell a story of one of our members who unfortunately cannot tell her own story here because of the unfortunate reasons of immigration. And um, the story will be read in her voice. And here it goes. My name is Danya. I'm gay and I'm Muslim. I want to share my story with you because I really hope that things can change for me and I will have the opportunity to live openly and happily as a gay person. I grew up in a strongly religious Muslim community. There were many extremists. Life was very scary for me. Why? Because being gay is a sin in Quran and people have the right to do something about this sin, or even worse, killing those people who are gay. Since I was a teenager, I dreamt of coming here to the United States because I saw the celebration of Gay Pride Parade in San Francisco, California, on the satellite television. I was so excited. There were women and women holding hands and kissing each other. They looked so happy. Nobody threw stones at them, and no guns fired at them. Their existence seems so peaceful and life seems so smooth. Sex is tabooed in the Muslim community and even more so certainly wrong about being gay. I felt a lot of stress and fear living there. In Indonesia, I read in the news about how the Muslims killed a man because he was gay and people were okay with that. A woman was raped because she was a lesbian, and the rapist justified his action by saying that it was because he wanted to make her straight again. It is so sick. People laughed and mocked the transsexual people because they think that transsexual people are clowns or that they are sick and crazy. When I was 15, I told my best friend that I'm gay, and she was very afraid of me. She never talked to me again. I felt really upset. Around the same time, my family asked me to get married with a the man they had chosen for me. I refused and I told them that I was gay. They were shocked and said that I was crazy. I felt very stressed out. Sometimes it crossed my mind that maybe I should end my life. But thank God I stay strong because I believe I'm a normal person just like any other. In 2002, my mother asked me to come to the United States to visit my family, and I was very happy. I adapted fast. I learned English quickly. I felt free like a butterfly. I could do and say whatever I wanted, and I found that I was happy. I could be myself and be gay. I couldn't describe that feeling with words. I felt blessed and joyous. Then I decided to stay in this country. I applied for asylum in 2003 against my country. I explained to the judge everything that I had experienced in the past living in a Muslim country. I explained that I did not feel safe living there. I was fearful of being gay and I was afraid that if the Muslim people or somebody found out, they would kill me. Unfortunately, the judge did not grant my case. She denied my case because she said I did not have strong evidence to prove that I'm gay. And she said that I'm not under life-threatening danger. I was shocked and extremely sad that I had lost my case. I showed the judge all the proof I have, including an assessment from my psychologist and proof that my country is against gay people. Nothing could change her mind. I was truly surprised that there's still no support for gay people even in this country of so-called freedom. It is a shame. I hope one day the United States will reform immigration and provide better protection for gay people. I have been living in the U.S. without status ever since. It's not the same living here without legal status. I will be treated as a criminal if I'm caught. I cannot speak freely, I cannot travel, and it feels almost the same as if I'm back in Indonesia. The only difference is that I can say that I'm gay here. I don't feel safe and secure here. I'm not protected by the law. When it comes to employment, the situation is even worse. I have no power to negotiate for a decent wage, and my options for jobs are very limited. At the same time, the employers can treat me however badly they want to and exploit my hard labor because I don't have any power against them for as long as I need the money to survive. I cannot complain. I cannot get health insurance. 
I cannot get days off, and at times I don't even get paid for my work. I work many hours just to pay rent, food, and medical bills. I'm worked like a machine nonstop, but if I get sick, I'm fired on the spot. There's a lot of discrimination against illegal, illegal immigrants. I get nasty stares from people. I get spoken down to. People make mean remarks. I get bullied and blackmailed for being illegal. There's no quality to my life. Of course, not having paperwork also means alienation from my family. I have not seen them ever since I got here, and I will not be able to see them for I don't know how long. People look down on me, even though I have learned English. People avoid having friends who are illegal, and I feel very isolated. It is even harder to find a partner who understands my situation. Without financial stability, having time constraint for long working hours, and not being able to travel with my partner makes it very difficult to work out a relationship. So this is my life. It is a struggle on a daily basis, and with not much to look forward to in the future. It is terrible being vulnerable and of a lower class. Many bad things keep happening, like an endless bad dream. I truly hope that the immigration laws will change to help protect queer people like me. It is my dream to live freely with my sexual orientation and to live a happy, fulfilled life. Thank you. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Today, we're bringing you stories of queer immigrants in the U.S. from a March 2010 forum called Invisibly American, The Personal is Political in Queer Immigrant Rights. Coming up next, a personal story told by Reverend Noel Gordon. People, how are you? I rarely get to speak. Actually, I don't talk about my experience as um, an immigrant here. So this is the first time actually I'm going to talk about this, and I'm pretty sure some of my friends here don't, don't even know about my experience. So here it is. I came to the United States when I was 14 years old. I came with my father and my brother, who was 11 then, on a tourist visa, and my father had a crazy idea that I should stay behind to finish two years of high school here. So I enrolled in a private high school with a school's uh, full knowledge of my situation and I applied for a conversion of my tourist visa to a student visa. Uh, I didn't hear from the Immigration Naturalization Service until the end of my high school years. Uh, denying my request and ordered me to go back to my country. Well, at that time I was uh, just beginning to explore my gay identity and so I decided to stay behind and enroll in college. I didn't tell my father the reason, but uh, despite the precarious situation, I felt that I could better nurture my gay identity here. I just felt that this country was more tolerant and uh, perhaps more understanding of this new identity that I'm grappling with. However, that decision came with a price, you see. I was not able to see my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters, my, my very important family for, for eight years that I was an undocumented immigrant. And I must say that it was, it was one of the loneliest periods of my life. I remember the day when I departed for the United States and my grandmother saw me off at the airport and she said tearfully in her very dramatic way, <laughs> Filipino way, I have this feeling that we won't see each other anymore, that this is our final goodbye. And she was right. My grandmother, um, who probably the woman of my life, closer to her spiritually than to my mother, uh, had a stroke and shortly died thereafter. And one of my struggles was how I want to see her, even though she's dead. I want to be part of her burial. I want to say goodbye. But I wasn't. I, I had to face a decision. I could have gone back and attend the burial, but, but two things. I was in, in a partnership at that time. I, I had a, a, a lover, which meant if I go home, I can come back and I won't see my lover at all. And it's probably one of the most wounding experiences of my life. 
not to be able to say goodbye to someone I really, really love. Probably the, the woman that I really ever, ever loved deeply. And I don't think I ever recovered from that wound. I'm terrible in saying goodbye. So for eight years as an undocumented immigrant, I lived with fear that somehow the INS, the Immigration Naturalization Service, would just somehow show up at my door and catch me and deport me. At age 18, I had my first relationship, my dear relationship. You know, when, when you first love, you just, you're just so in love, right? <laughs> but I turned out to be that the man I was in love with um, was a pretty violent man. So I was in a domestic violence situation. And he knew of my undocumented status. And part of the abuse sometimes was that he would threaten that he would turn me over to the INS. That was hard. That was very hard. I distinctly remember one episode when, when my abusive partner really got me all blooded up. I was really all blooded up. But I chose not to go to the emergency room or the police because I feared that, that somehow I would be arrested and deported. And this story is not unique because in my work as a social worker in my, and in my ministry, many undocumented immigrants who are in domestic violence situations do not seek the necessary medical and legal services for fear of being deported. So in 1986, though, uh, the United States Congress enacted the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which was signed by President Reagan. I'm not a lover of President Reagan, but for that, I do love him. <laughs> and the law granted amnesty to more than 2.5 million undocumented immigrants who had been residing in the United States since 1982. So I was part of that amnesty, and I eventually I obtained my permanent residency and um, U.S. citizenship. So, in deep gratitude to this beautiful country, but yet deeply, deeply aware of its imperfection and injustices, I said, well, you know, not now an American, I will make it my life mission to serve this country. There is an African proverb that says, there is a blessing next to the wound. So this wound of having been undocumented immigrant is also in a way a blessing for me because from this wound emerged my vocation as a priest and my calling as a social worker to dedicate my life not to the powerful and the rich, but to the most vulnerable residents and citizens of these countries, victims still of our, of our injustices that are found here. So I think I will end here. And I thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Sadat Iqbal, I'm a youth leader at the Asian and Pacific Islander Coalition on HIV AIDS. But today, I'm here to share the story of my friend Pradeep. He's actually here tonight, so no worries. But for reasons of anonymity and safety, he wanted me to read this. The only clear memory I have of home is a guava tree. The fruit was sour and chalky with seeds. I was brought to this country when I was three years old. I haven't been able to make my way back since. I can't imagine what my parents must have been thinking crossing the black water. There's a silence about the past. My family first lived in a cramped apartment in Astoria with my uncle and his four roommates. My dad was a gas station attendant and my mom sewed hundreds of intricate little buttons for five cents a piece. She was a teacher back home. As a child, I would ask them, when can we go to Bangladesh? Every time, the same response, next year, Baba. My family applied for a tourist visa to America and overstayed. This was a common strategy for many immigrants because the government used to periodically give amnesty. My dad moved up the blue collar ladder to a managerial position. He bought us a middle class life, a house, a car, a big TV, college education. We have social security numbers, we pay our taxes but we're in a strange in-between space, like so many people. I was kept in the dark. I was a kid. The issue started to become clear in 2001. 9-11 was the first day of my freshman year in high school. I was a kid. I remember seeing women in hijab begging on the streets of Jackson Heights. My father and brother had to go to an ICE center for special registration. They told me about seeing brown men locked behind bars. 
I was under 18 and didn't have to go. Since immigration has been reorganized through the Department of Homeland Security, the occasional rounds of amnesty have stopped. And our case, which had been pending, got denied. All of this became real for me when I started my college applications. I couldn't fill out the FAFSA to take out student loans. I attended a university in New York that provided a merit scholarship. And for the check boxes, I marked what I needed to. The first year of college made me so bitter. I was in a scholars program where you get free trips to cool places like Peru or India. People constantly asked me why I couldn't go. But I couldn't speak. How can I explain this to a stranger? If I leave the country, I can't come back. Sometimes I feel like my concerns are privileged. I'm one of millions in this situation and better off than most. But it is still very painful. My mother told me, a tree grows strong in its natural environment. Uprooted, it grows awkward and crooked, or withers away. What she means to say is that her son's a faggot. <laughs> but I know she speaks from desperation and anger. She sacrificed all she's ever known to bring me here. It's been 20 years. Her parents have died, and she hasn't been able to say goodbye. For immigrants, the law strictly sets the limits of our ability, our mobility, our access to education, employment, health care, even our very speech. These policies leave wounds upon our bodies that cut deep into the psyche. It's painful. And the worst part is that it's masked in silence. The cruelty of these laws is that we can't mourn, we can't grieve. But I believe our scars can also be a source of strength. We survive through the kindness of friends that are more like family, through the stories and knowledge we share, by the community we build together. We collectively heal by kissing each other's wounds. If there's one place where I've found home, it's New York. I found my voice in the place. You just heard the stories of people who will be affected by changes to U.S. immigration policy. But what changes are on the table? Trishala Deb, program officer for the National LGBT Rights Program at the Arcus Foundation, says there are a wide variety of policies that may be changed, which is why it's so important for immigrants, queers, and all Americans to pay attention and get involved. I want to just acknowledge some of the framing of how the immigration rights debate is going to roll out in the U.S. media and through the kind of lens of policymakers. Um, we really are going to see the reiteration of three themes which have been very strong in the last three rounds of immigration reform. One is the myth of desire and choice. It's the idea that people come to this country to go to the shopping mall. And it's a narrative that doesn't acknowledge the massive displacement of people around the globe. 14 million migrants every year, only 1% of which ever go through the United States. The second is the myth of criminality and terrorism, that we have more to fear from each other than to learn from each other, based in an understanding that the war on terrorism still defines this whole conversation. And the third is the myth of the fair labor market, that if you work hard, and especially if you are documented, that you can become a middle-class U.S. citizen. When in fact, the very prevalence of all of us, including those of us who are undocumented, make it possible for those who are the richest in this country to maintain their standard of living. So, given that, I just did want to take a second to look at some of the basic components of immigration reform. The real point of this conversation is to say that the immigration reform debate is going to be kind of like a shell game. And these are basic components which are going to get traded, bought, sold, and upgraded and downgraded over the course of many months. Clearly one of the biggest pieces that is getting talked about in immigration reform is the issue of legalization. How that connects to driver's licenses and IDs, work authorization, visas, and access to benefits, as the speakers talked about just a minute ago. Um, a second category that we're going to hear a lot about is family unification, which includes the question of who can be sponsored. Does it include our parents, our children, our uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents, and our lovers, as well as the reduction of the backlog, people who are waiting who have families who can sponsor them. We also know that 
a big part of the proposal includes the DREAM Act, which is about the ability of undocumented students to access higher education and um, federal support and subsidies for that. And then a huge, huge component of immigration reform, regardless of who proposes it, is going to be enforcement. Um, and really the bulk of immigration reform will will be rooted in this area. So that includes border militarization, detention, and deportation. For those of us who are LGBT, it means we need to think about how we get profiled at border crossings based on our gender identity, homophobia, and race. Our access to safety, medication, and appropriate medical care if we are detainees, especially if we're trans and HIV and or HIV positive. And um, finally, the the in disproportionate rate of detention, deportation of trans our trans community members due to gender identity um, inconsistencies of gender identity on our documents. Um, we are also looking at a big piece around the protection and also enforcement around workers. So that includes the ag jobs, which is really about migrant workers' rights to livable wage employment, and a, a very bad set of goals around employment verification, which is using social security numbers to track people through their work sites. And then finally, we have a big category around asylum reform, which is often overlooked and which I think we're going to have to really fight to see included which includes the expansion of categories by which we can apply for asylum and ending a one-year cap, which means that we need to establish our ability to apply for asylum even if we're here for longer than a year. For a lot of us who are undocumented LGBT immigrants, asylum is still our one and only option, oftentimes for access to permanent status. So given that those are some of the categories we're looking at, and I think that this gives us an opportunity to decide what our frame is going to be. When we hear about the proposals that are coming out of Congress, I think it's up to all of us to educate ourselves on what pieces we think are the most important, what pieces we want to support, and really importantly, what pieces do not criminalize each other. And I think we have the possibility of holding a different narrative, including that for any part of our identities, whether it's being queer, trans, a person of color, or undocumented, that not a single one of us is illegal or alien, that migration is a result of displacement based on globalization and war, and that any answer to an immigration crisis has to start there. That we have to fight for each other, for every single one of us, for all of each other. And we have to get better at fighting for the people that don't look like us and are not at all like us, but are still vulnerable in some of the ways we are. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. You've been listening to segments of a public forum called Invisibly American, The Personal is Political in Queer Immigrant Rights. Special thanks to Out FM on WBAI in New York City. For a CD copy of this program, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736. Or check out our website at radioproject.org to get our podcast, download past shows, or help make a difference by supporting our work. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. This time we went too far. Truth and Consequences of the Gaza Invasion. That's the new book by historian Norman Finkelstein, a riveting scholar and the son of Nazi Holocaust survivors. Finkelstein speaks in Berkeley on a double bill with Iraqi UK hip hop phenomenon Low Key, a benefit for the Middle East Children's Alliance on Thursday, May 13th, 7.30 p.m. at King Middle School near the North Berkeley BART. Tickets are $15 at area bookstores, $10 for students with ID. For info, visit www.meccaforpeace.org or call 510-548-0542. Co-sponsored by KPFA and others, the event is wheelchair accessible and ASL interpreted. That's Norman Finkelstein and Low Key, May 13th, King Middle School in Berkeley. listening to 